Okay, chapter 62, fractures. A fracture is a disruption or break in the continuity of the structure of the bone. Although traumatic injuries account for the majority of fractures, some fractures are secondary to a disease process. Something like cancer or osteoporosis. Fractures can be classified as open, formerly called compound, or closed, formerly called simple, depending on communication or non-communication with the external environment. You can look at figure 62-6. Uh, In an open fracture, the skin is broken, exposing the bone and causing soft tissue injury. In a closed fracture, the skin has not been ruptured and remains intact. Fractures can also be classified as complete or incomplete. A fracture is termed complete if the break is goes through the bone and incomplete if the fracture occurs partly across the bone shaft but the bone is still intact. An incomplete fracture is often the result of bending or crushing force, forces applied to the bone. Fractures are also described and classified according to the direction of the fracture line. Types include linear, oblique, transverse, longitudinal, and spiral fractures. So the next slide it, um, refers to figure 62-7. So um, figure A is transverse fracture. It is a fracture in which the line of the fracture extends across the bone shaft at a right angle to the longitudinal axis. B, a spiral fracture, is a fracture in which the line of the fracture extends in a spiral di direction along the shaft of the bone. C, a green stick fracture, is an incomplete fracture with one side splintered and the other side bent. D, commuted fracture is a fracture with more than two fragments. The smaller fragments appear to be floating. E is an oblique fracture in which the line of the fracture extends in an oblique direction. F, pathologic fracture is spontaneous fracture at the site of a bone disease. And G, a stress fracture is a fracture that occurs a normal or abnormal bone that is subject to repeated stress, such as from jogging or running. Finally, fractures can also be classified as displaced or non-displaced. In a displaced fracture, the two ends of the broken bone are separated from one another and out of their normal positions. Displaced fractures are often commuted more than two fragments or oblique, um, see figure 62-7 in the previous slide. On a non-displaced fracture, there, the periosteum is intact across the fracture and the bone fragments are still in alignment. Non-displaced fractures are usually transverse, spiral, or green stick. The clinical manifestations of a fracture include immediate, immediate localized pain, decreased function, the inability to bear weight <clears throat> on or use the affected part, the patient guards and protects the extremity against movement, obvious bone deformity may not be present. If a fracture is suspected, the extremity is immobilized in the position in which it's found, unnecessary movement increases soft tissue damage and may convert a closed fracture to an open fracture or create further injury to adjacent nerves and blood vessels. Many factors influence the time required for complete fracture healing, including displacement and site of the fracture, blood supply to the area, immobilization and use of internal fixation devices like screws and pins. The ossification process may be slowed or even stopped by inadequate reduction and immobilization. Excessive movement of fracture fragments 
infection, poor nutrition, and systemic disease. <clears throat> Healing time for fractures increases with age. Smoking also increases fracture healing time. Fracture healing may not occur in expected time or may not occur at all. The overall goals of fraction treatment are anatomic realignment of bone fragments through reduction, two, immobilization to maintain realignment, and three, restoration of normal or near normal function of the injured part. So closed reductions, I see these all the time in the ED. Um, with a closed reduction, uh, this is non-surgical, manual realignment of bone fragments to their previous anatomic position. Traction and countertraction are manually applied to the bone fragments to restore position, length, and alignment. Closed reductions are usually performed while the patient is under local or general anesthesia. Traction, casting, external fixation, splints, or braces may be used after reduction or um, after the reduction to maintain alignment and immobilize the injured part until healing occurs. Or, and we see this all the time in the ED. An open reduction is the correction of the bone alignment through surgical incision. It usually includes internal fixation of the fracture with the use of wire screws, pins, plates, um, extra medullary rods or nails. The main risks of this form of fracture management are infection, complications associated with anesthesia, and the effect of pre-existing medical conditions, so something like diabetes. ORIF facilitates, that's open reduction, uh, facilitates early ambulation that decreases the risk of complications related to prolonged immobility. Traction is used to uh, prevent or reduce pain and muscle spasm, for example, whiplash or unrepaired hip fracture. It um, immobilizes a joint or part of the body. It reduces a fracture or dislocation, and it treats a pathological joint condition, like a tumor or an infection. <clears throat> Traction devices apply a pulling force on the fractured extremity to attain realignment while counteraction pulls in the opposite direction. The two most common types of traction are skin traction and skeletal traction. So let's talk about skin traction. Um, it's generally used for short-term treatment, 48 to 72 hours until skeletal traction or surgery is possible. Tape, boots, or splints are applied directly to the skin to maintain alignment, primarily to help diminish muscle spasms in the injured extremity. The traction weights are usually limited to 5 to 10 pounds. A Buck's traction boot is a type of skin traction used preoperatively for a patient with hip fracture to reduce muscle spasms, and you can refer to um, figure 62-9. In skin traction, regular assessment of the skin is a priority because pressure points and skin breakdown may develop quickly. Assess key pressure points every two to four hours. A Buck's traction boot is a type of skin traction that is used to immobilize a fracture, prevent hip flexion contractures, and reduce muscle spasms. Skeletal traction generally in place for longer periods than skin traction. It's used to align injured bones and joints or to treat joint contractures and congenital hip dysplasia. It provides a long-term pull that keeps the injured bones and joints aligned. To apply skeletal traction, the surgeon inserts a pin or wire into the bone and weights are attached to align and immobilize the injured body part. Weight for skeletal traction ranges from 5 to 45 pounds. The use of too much weight can result in delayed union or non-union. The major complications of skeletal traction are infection at the pin insertion site 
and the effects of prolonged immobility. When traction is used to treat fractures, the forces are usually exerted <coughs> excuse me, on the distal fragments to obtain alignment with proximal fragment. One of the more common types of skeletal traction is balance suspension traction in figure 62-10. Fracture alignment depends on the correct positioning and alignment of the patient while the traction forces remain constant. For extremity traction to be effective, forces must be pulling in the opposite direction. Counter traction is commonly supplied by the patient's body weight or by weights pulling in the opposite direction, or it may be augmented by elevating the end of the bed. Traction must be maintained continuously. Keep the weights off the floor and moving freely through the pulleys. A cast is a temporary immobilization device. Casting is common treatment for following closed reduction. It allows the patient to perform many normal activities of daily living while providing sufficient immobilization to ensure stabi stability. stability. Cast materials are natural. Plaster of Paris, um, synthetic acrylic, fiberglass free, latex free polymer, or hybrid of materials. A cast generally incorporates the joints above and below a fracture. Immobilization above and below a joint restricts tendon and ligament movement, therefore assisting with joint stabilization while the fracture heals. To apply a cast on an extremity, the affected part is first covered with a stockinette that is cut longer than the extremity, then place cotton padding over the stockinette with bony promises given extra padding. If plaster of Paris casting material is used, immerse it in warm water and then wrap and mold it around the affected part. The number of layers of plaster bandage and the technique of application determine the strength of the cast. The plaster sets within 15 minutes so the patient may move around without difficulty. However, it's not strong enough for weight bearing until about 24 to 72 hours after application. The final decision about weight bearing is determined by the physician. A fresh plaster cast should never be covered because air cannot circulate. Heat then builds up in the cast and may cause a burn and drying is delayed. Avoid direct pressure in the cast during the drying period. Handle the cast gently with an open palm to avoid denting the cast. Once the cast is thoroughly dry, the rough edges may need to be pedaled to minimize skin irritation from rough edges and to prevent plaster of Paris debris from falling into the cast and causing irritation or pressure necrosis. Several strips of tape are placed by the healthcare provider over the rough areas to ensure a smooth cast edge. Casts made of synthetic materials are being used more than plaster because they are lightweight, <clears throat> stronger, relatively waterproof, and provide for early weight bearing. The synthetic casting materials are activate, activated by submersion in cool or tepid water. Then they are molded to fit the torso or extremity. Immobilization of acute fracture or soft tissue injury <clears throat> of the upper extremity is often accomplished by the use of the sugar tongue splint, the posterior splint, the short arm cast, and the long arm cast in figure 62-11. The sugar tongue splint is typically used for acute wrist injuries or injuries that result in significant swelling. Splints are applied beginning at the phalangeal joints of the hand extending up to the dorsal aspect of the forearm, around the distal humerus, and then down the volar aspect of the forearm to the distal palmar crease. 
The splinting material is wrapped with either elastic bandage or bias stockinette, accommodating early swelling in the fractured extremity. The short arm cast is often used for treatment of stable wrist or metacarpal fractures. An aluminum finger split can be incorporated into the short arm cast for concurrent treatment of phalangeal injuries. This cast provides wrist immobilization and permits unrestricted elbow motion. The long arm cast is commonly used for stable forearm or elbow fractures and unstable wrist fractures. It is similar to the short arm cast but extends to the proximal humerus, restricting motion of the wrist and elbow. Support the extremity and reduce the effects of edema by maintaining elevation of the extremity with a sling. However, when a hanging arm cast is used for a proximal humerus fracture, elevation of a excuse me, elevation or a supportive sling is contraindicated because hanging provides traction and maintains fracture alignment. When a sling is used, ensure the axillary area is well padded to prevent skin excoriation and maceration associated with direct skin-to-skin -skin contact. Placement of the sling should not put undue pressure on the neck. Encourage movement of the fingers unless it's contraindicated to enhance the pumping action of blood vessels to decrease edema. Also encourage the patient to actively move non-immobilized joints of the upper extremity to prevent stiffness and contractures. The body jacket brace is used for immobilization and support for stable spine injuries of the thoracic or lumbar spine. The brace goes around the chest and the abdomen, extending from above the nipple line to the pubis. After application of the brace, assess the patient for development of superior mesentric artery syndrome, or CAST syndrome. This condition occurs if the brace is applied too tightly which results in compression of the superior mesentric artery against the duodenum. The patient generally complains of abdominal pain, abdominal pressure, nausea, and vomiting. <clears throat> Assess the abdomen for decreased bowel sounds. A window in the brace may be left over the umbilicus. Treatment includes gastric decompression with an NG tube and suction. Assessment also includes monitoring respiratory status, bowel and bladder function, and areas of pressure over the bony prominences, especially the iliac crest. The brace may need to be adjusted or removed if complications occur. Then for lower extremities, we have um, injuries to the lower extremities are often immobilized by the long leg cast, short leg cast, cylinder cast or prefabricated splint or immobilizer. The usual indications for applying a long leg cast are an unstable ankle fracture, soft tissue injuries, a fractured tibia, and knee injuries. The cast usually extends from the base of the toes to the groin and gluteal crease. The short leg cast is used primarily um, for stable ankle or, and or foot injuries. A cylinder cast, which is used for knee injuries or fractures, extends from the groin to the malleola of the ankle. A Robert Jones dressing may be used temporary, temporarily to limit mobility of a joint. It is composed of soft padding materials, splints, and an elastic wrap or a bias cut stockinette. After the application of the lower extremity cast or dressing, the extremity should be elevated on pillows above the heart level for the first four, 24 hours. After the initial phase, a cast extremity should not be placed in a dependent position because of the possibility of excessive edema. After cast application, observe for signs of compartment syndrome and increased pressure, especially in the heel, anterior tibia, head of fibula, and malleola. This increased pressure is manifested by pain or burning in these areas.
Prefabricated knee and ankle splints and immobilizers are used in many settings. This type of immobilization is easy to apply and remove, which permits close observation of an affected joint or signs of swelling and skin breakdown. Depending on the injury, removal of the splint or immobilizer facilitates range of motion of the affected joint and faster return to function. And these knee mobilizers are not easy to apply, in my opinion. <laughs> the hip spicocast is now mainly used for femur fractures in children to immobilize the affected extremity and trunk. It extends from the nipple line to the base of the foot, that's a single spica, and may include the opposite extremity up to the area above the knee, that's the spica and a half, or both extremities, that's the double spica. Here's um, a visual of the various types of casts. An external fixator is a metal, metallic device composed of metal pins that are inserted into the bone and attached to external rods to stabilize the fracture while it heals. It can be used to apply traction or to compress fracture fragments and immobilize reduced fragments when the use of a cast or other traction is not appropriate. The external device holds fracture fragments in place similar to a surgically implanted internal device. And in figure A, that's the stabilization of a hand injury, and B, that's the stabiliz stabilization of a knee injury with pins in the femur and tibia. External fixation is often used in an attempt to salvage extremities that otherwise might require amputation. Because the use of the external device is a long-term process, ongoing assessment for pin loosening and infection is critical. Infection, which would be indicated by exudate, erythema, tenderness, and pain, may require removal of the device. Instruct the patient and caregiver about a meticulous pin care plan. Although each physician has protocol for pin care cleaning, chlorhexidine, 2 mg, is often used. Internal fixation devices, so pins, plates, rods, and screws, are surgically inserted to realign and maintain position of bony fragments. These metal devices are biologically inert and made from stainless steel or titanium. Proper alignment and bone healing are evaluated regularly by x-rays. Um, this figure is uh, pins in the femur and the tibia. Electric bone growth simulation is used to facilitate the healing process for certain types of fractures, especially for fractured non-union or delayed union. The mechanism of action of electrical bone stimulation may include increasing the calcium uptake of the bone act to activating intracellular calcium stores and three, increasing the production of bone growth factors. It is non-invasive, uh, semi-invasive, and invasive. Um, we can use all three methods of electrical bone growth stimulation. Non-invasive stimulators are used direct, current, or pulsed electromagnetic fields to generate a weak electrical current. Electrodes are typically in a band applied over the patient's skin or cast and worn 10 to 12 hours each day usually while the patient is sleeping. Semi-invasive or percutaneous bone growth stimulators use an external power supply and electrodes that are inserted through the skin and into the bone. Invasive bone, bone growth stimulators require surgical implantation of a current generator in the IM or subcutaneous space. An electrode is implanted in the bone fragments.
Patients with fractures experience varying degrees of pain associated with muscle spasms. Central and peripheral muscle relaxants, such as soma or flexero, uh, rubaxin, may be, may be prescribed for management of pain associated with muscle spasms. The threat of tetanus from an open fracture can be reduced by administering a tetanus shot if a person hasn't hasn't had theirs within the last 10 years or so. Bone penetrating antibiotics such as cephalosporin are used prophylactically before surgery. An adequate energy source is needed to promote muscle strength and tone, build endurance, and provide en energy for ambulation and gait training skills. The patient's dietary requirements must include adequate protein, vitamins, and calcium, phosphorus, and magnesium to ensure optimal soft tissue and bone healing. Three well-balanced meals a day usually provide the necessary nutrients. A well-balanced meal should, should be supplemented by fluid intake of 2,000 to 3,000 mLs a day to promote optimal bladder and bowel function. Adequate fluid and high-fiber diet with fruits and vegetables will prevent constipation. If immobilized in bed with skeletal traction or in a body jacket brace, Instruct the patient to eat six small meals so as not to overeating that can contribute to abdominal pressure and cramping. Place a small emphasis on the region distal to the site of energy, um, injury. Document clinical findings before fracture treatment is initiated to avoid doubts about whether a problem discovered later was missed during the original examination or was caused by the treatment. Your neurovascular assessment should include musculoskeletal injuries. Um, they have the potential for causing changes in the neurovascular status of an injured extremity. Application of a cast or constrictive dressing, poor positioning, and physiological responses to a traumatic injury can cause nerve or vascular damage usually distal to the injury. The neurovascular assessment should consist of peripheral vascular assessment, so color, temperature, capillary refill, peripheral pulses, and edema, and a peripheral neurologic assessment, which includes sensation, motor function, and pain. Your peripheral vascular assessment, you must assess the extremity's color pink, pale, or cyanotic, and temperature, is it hot, warm, cold, cool, in the area of the affected extremity. Pallor or a cool, cold extremity below the injury could indicate arterial insufficiency. A warm, cyanotic extremity could indicate poor venous return. Assess capillary refill, flanching of the nail bed, a compressed nail bed should return to its original color within three seconds. Compare pulses on both the unaffected and the injured extremity to identify differences in rate or quality. This con contralateral evaluation is critical. Pulses are described as strong, diminished, audible by Doppler, or absent. A diminished or absent pulse distal to the injury can indicate vascular dysfunction and insufficiency. Also, assess peripheral edema. Pitting edema may be present with severe injury. <clears throat> peripheral neurologic assessment assess ulnar, median, and radial nerve function to evaluate sensation and motor in innervation in the upper extremity. Assess motor function by asking the patient to abduct the fingers, oppose the thumb and small finger, and flex and extend the wrist or the fingers if in a cast. In the lower extremity, assess the patient's ability to perform dorsal flexion and plantar flexion. 
evaluate sensory function of the perineal nerve by touching the web space between the great and second toe. Stroke the plantar surface, the sole of the foot, to assess sensory function of the tibial nerve. Paresthesia. So what is paresthesia again? That numbness or tingling. And hypersensation may be reported by the patient. Partial or full loss of sensation may be a late sign of neurovascular damage. Instruct patients to immediately report any changes in, in sensation or the ability to move the digits in the affected extremity. So your patient teaching, if surgical intervention is required to treat a fracture, patients will need preoperative preparation. In addition to the usual preoperative nursing measures, we also must inform patients of the type of immobilization and assistive devices that will be used and the expected activity limitations after surgery. Assure patients that nursing staff will help meet the personal needs until they can again meet re and resume self-care. Remind patients that pain medication will be available if needed. In general, post-operative nursing care and management are directed toward monitoring vital signs and applying the general principles of post-operative nursing care. Frequent neurovascular assessments of the affected extremity are necessary to detect early and subtle changes. Closely monitor and any limitations of movement or activity related to turning, positioning, and extremity support. Pain and discomfort can be minimized through proper alignment and positioning. Carefully observe dressings or casts for any signs of bleeding or drainage. Report significant increase in size of the drainage area. If a wound drainage system is in place, regularly measure the volume of drainage and ass assess its character. For example, bloody and purulent. Also assess the patency of the drainage system using aseptic technique to avoid contamination. Adir uh, excuse me, additional nursing responsibilities depend on the type of immobilization used. A blood salvage and reinfusion system may be used to allow recovery and reinfusion of the patient's own blood may be used. The blood is retrieved from a joint space or cavity and the patient receives this blood in the form of an autotransfusion. Patients often have reduced mobility as a result of a fracture. Plan care to prevent the many complications associated with immobility. Prevent constipation by increasing patient activity and maintenance of high fluid intake more than 2500 mLs per day unless it's contraindicated. And a diet high in bulk and roughage, so fresh fruits and vegetables. If these measures are not effective in maintaining the patient's normal bowel elimination pattern, administer stool softeners, laxatives, or suppositories. Maintain a regular time for elimination to promote, to promote bowel regularity. Renal cal calculi can develop from bone demineralization result related to reduced mobility. The hypercalcemia from the demineralization causes a rise in the urine pH and stone form formation resulting from the precipitation of calcium. Unless contraindicated, fluid intake of 2,500 milliliters per day is recommended. Rapid deconditioning of cardiopulmonary system can occur as a result of prolonged bed rest resulting in orthostatic hypotension and decreased lung capacity. Unless contraindicated, these effects can be diminished by having the patient sit on the side of the bed, allowing the patient's lower limbs to dangle over the bedside and having the patient perform standing transfers. When the patient is allowed to increase activity, assess for orthostatic hypotension. Also, assess patients for DVTs and pulmonary emboli.
When slings are used with traction, regularly inspect exposed skin areas. Persistent skin pressure may impair blood flow and cause injury to peripheral neurovascular structures. Observe skeletal traction or external fixation pin sites for signs of infection. Pin site care may vary, but often includes regularly cleansing with chlorhexidine, rinsing pin sites with sterile saline, and drying the area with sterile gauze. <clears throat> external rotation of the affected extremity is a classic assessment finding for a patient with unrepaired hip fracture. If skin traction is ordered preoperatively, apply traction without attempting to reposition or realign the extremity. Keep the patient in the center of the bed in the supine position to provide adequate counter-traction. To offset possible problems associated with pro prolonged immobility, discuss specific patient activity with the healthcare professional. If exercise is permitted, encourage participation by the patient in a simple exercise regimen based on activity restrictions. Encourage the patient to participate in frequent position changes, range of motion exercises of unaffected joints, deep breathing exercises, isometric exercises and the use of the trapeze bar, if it's permitted, to raise the body off the bed for linen changes and placements of the bed pan. Encourage and facilitate the hospital patient to stay connected with friends and family by telephone and through social media resources. <clears throat> So because um, uncomplicated fractures are treated in an outpatient setting, the patient may require only a short hospitalization or none at all, regardless of the type of cast material. A cast can interfere with circulation and nerve function from being applied too tightly or because of excessive edema that occurs after application. Frequent neurovascular assessment of, um, and of the immobilized extremity is crucial. Teach the patient to recognize and promptly report signs of cast complications. Explain the importance of elevating the extremity above the heart level to promote venous return and applying ice to control or prevent edema are measures <clears throat> frequently used during the initial phase. However, if compartment syndrome is suspected, do not elevate the extremity above the heart. Once again, if compartment syndrome is suspected, do not elevate the extremity above the heart. Instruct the patient to exercise joints above and below the cast. For itching, suggest the use of a hair dryer set on cool setting to be directed under the cast. Check with your healthcare provider before getting fiber, fiberglass cast wet. <coughs> Dry cast thoroughly if inadvertently exposed to water. Blot dry with a towel. Use a hair dryer on low setting until the cast is thoroughly dry. Report signs of possible problems to the healthcare provider. So that would be increasing pain despite elevation, ice, and analgesia. Swelling associated with pain or discoloration of the toes or fingers. Pain during movement. Burning or tingling under the cast sores or foul odor under the cast. Do not, do not, if compartment syndrome is suspected, do not, do not elevate the extremity above the heart. Do not get plaster casts wet. Discourage pulling out cast padding and scratching or placing foreign objects inside the cast because it breed disposes the patient to skin breakdown and infection. Do not bear weight on the new cast for 48 hours and do not cover cast with plastic for prolonged periods. Validate the patient's and the caregiver's understanding of these instructions before discharge. A follow-up phone contact is appropriate and home care nursing visits are warranted, especially for the patient with body jacket brace. The cast is removed in an outpatient setting. Patients often fear being cut by the blade of the cast saw. Reassure the patient that damage to the skin is unlikely. Teach the patient about possible alterations in the appearance of the extremity. 
so it, it most likely is going to be dry wrinkled and smaller than the other arm or leg because there's a little bit of atrophied muscle the patient may also have anxiety related to using the injured extremity after the cast is removed and then our psychosocial uh, short-term rehabilitation rehabilitative goals address the transition from dependence to independence and performing simple activities of daily living and preserving or increasing strength and endurance. During the rehab phase, help the patient to adjust to any problems caused by the injury. <clears throat> Offer support and encouragement while actively listening to the patient and caregiver's concerns. Know the overall goals of physical therapy in relation to the patient's abilities, needs, and tolerance. Mobility training and instruction in the use of assistive devices, so canes, crutches, and walkers, constitute major areas of responsibility for physical therapists. Reinforce these instructions to the patient. The patient with lower extremity dysfunction usually starts mobility training when able to sit in bed and dangle the feet over the side. Collaborate with the physical therapist to administer analgesia before the physical therapy session. When the patient begins to ambulate, know the patient's weight-bearing status and the correct technique if the patient is using an assistive device. There are different degrees of weight-bearing ambulation. Um, we have non-weight-bearing, so no weight on the involved extremity touch down, toe touch weight bearing ambulation, that's contact with the floor for balance, but no weight bearing. Three, partial weight bearing ambulation, 25 to 50% of the patient's weight is tolerable. Weight bearing as tolerated based on the patient's pain and tolerance. And five, full weight bearing ambulation, so there's no limitations. Assistive devices. Devices for ambulation range from a cane to a walker or crutches. The healthcare provider decides which device is appropriate for a patient, balancing the need for maximum stability and safety versus maneuverability required in small spaces, spaces such as bathrooms. Discuss with the patient his or her lifestyle requirements and select a device that allows each patient to feel most secure and independent. The technique for using assistive ambulation devices varies. The involved limb is usually advanced at the same time or immediately after the advance of the device. The uninvolved limb is advanced last. <clears throat> in, most, in almost all cases, canes are held in the opposite hand, in the hand opposite of the involved extremity. Place a transfer belt or a gate belt around the patient's waist to provide stability during the learning stages of using assistive devices. Discourage the patient from reaching for furniture or relying on another person for support. If the patient has inadequate upper limb strength or poorly fitted crutches, he or she bears weight in the axilla rather than the hands, endangering the neurovascular bundle that passes across the axilla. Patients who must ambulate without wear without weight bearing requires sufficient upper limb strength to lift their own weight at each step. Because the muscles of the shoulder girdle and upper arm may not be accustomed to this work, patients require vigorous and diligent training and preparation for this task. Push-ups, pull-ups using the overhead trapeze bar and lifting weights develop the triceps and biceps muscles. Straight leg raises and quadricep setting exercises strengthen the quadricep muscles. The expected outcomes are that the patient with a fracture will report satisfactory pain management, demonstrate appropriate care of the cast or immobilizer, experience no peripheral neurovascular dysfunction, and experience uncomplicated bone healing. The majority of fractures heal without complications. 
death after a fracture is usually the result of damage to underlying organs and vascular structures or from complications of the, f of the fracture or immobility. Complications of fractures may be direct or indirect. Direct complications include problems with bone infection, bone union, and avascular necrosis. Indirect complications of fractures are associated with blood vessel and nerve damage resulting in conditions such as compartment syndrome, VTE, FES, breakdown of skeletal mus muscle, so the rhabdomyolysis, and hypovolemic shock. Most musculoskeletal injuries are not life-threatening. However, open fractures or fractures accompanied by severe blood loss and fractures that damage vital organs like your lungs or your heart are medical emergencies requiring immediate attention. Open fractures and soft tissue injuries have, the, have a high incidence of infection. Devitalized and contaminated tissue is an ideal medium for many um, pathogens. Treatment of infection is costly in terms of extended nursing and medical care, time for treatment, and loss of patient income. Delayed or ineffective treatment can lead to the development of chronic osteomyelitis. Open fractures require aggressive surgical debridement. The wound is initially cleaned by pulsating saline lavage in the operating room. Gross contaminants are irrigated and mechanically removed. Contuse contaminated and devitalized de tissue are surgically excised. The extent of the soft tissue damage determines if the wound will be closed at the time of surgery and if requires repeat debris, debridement, closed suction drainage, and skin graphing. Depending on the location and extent of the fracture, reduction may be maintained by external fixation or traction. During surgery, the open wound may, may be irrigated with antibiotic solution. Antibiotic impregnated beads may also be placed in the surgical site. The patient may have antibiotics administered IV for three to seven days during the postoperative phase. Compartment syndrome is a condition in which swelling causes increased pressure within a limited space, the muscle compartment. Because the fascia surrounding the muscle has limited ability to stretch, continued swelling can cause pressure that compromises the function of blood vessels nerves, and or tendons in the compartment. Capillary perfusion is reduced below a level needed for tissue vi viability. Compartment syndrome usually involves the leg, but can also occur in any muscle group, the arm, shoulder, buttock, or abdomen. Two basic types or excuse me, two basic causes of compartment syndrome are a decreased compartment size resulting from restrictive dressings, splints, cast, excessive traction, or premature closure of the fascia, or two, increased compartment contents related to bleeding, inflammation, edema, or IV infiltration. Edema can create sufficient pressure to obstruct circulation and cause venous occlusion, which further increases edema. Arterial flow is eventually compromised, causing ischemia in the extremity. As ischemia continues, muscle and nerve cells are destroyed. Fibrotic tissue usually replaces healthy tissue. Contracture, disability, and loss of function can occur. Delays in diagnosis and treatment result in irreversible muscle and nerve ischemia. The extremity may become functional, excuse me, functionally useless or severely impaired extremity. Compartment syndrome is usually associated with trauma, fractures, especially of the long bones, extensive soft tissue damage, and crush injury. Fractures of the distal, humerus, and proximal tibia 
are the most common fractures associated with compartment syndrome? Compartment syndrome is highly testable NCLEX topic. So know your compartment syndrome. Compartment syndrome may occur initially from the physiologic response of the body to the injury or it may be delayed for several days after the, after the original insult or injury. Ischemia can occur within four to eight hours after the onset of compartment syndrome. So NCLEX material, here you go. This slide, you know, you need to know your six P's, which are pain, pressure, paresthesia, pallor, paralysis, and pulselessness. One or more of the following six P's are characteristic of compartment syndrome. Pain out of proportion to the injury and that is not managed by opioid analgesics and pain on passive stretch of muscle traveling through the compartment. Two, pressure. Increasing pressure in the compartment. Three, Paresthesia, which is our numbness and tingling. Pallor, coolness, and loss of normal color to the extremity. Paralysis, or loss of function. And finally, pulselessness, diminished or absent peripheral pulses. Know your six P's for compartment syndrome. Prompt accurate diagnosis of compartment syndrome is critical. Perform and document regular neurovascular assessments on all patients with fractures, especially those with injury of the extremities or soft tissue injuries in these areas. Early recognition and effective treatment of compartment syndrome are essential to avoid permanent damage to muscle and nerves. Carefully assess the location, quality, and intensity of the pain. Evaluate the patient's level of pain on a scale of 0 to 10. Pain unrelieved by drugs and out of proportion to the level of injury is one of the first indications of impeding compartment syndrome. Paresthesia is also an early sign. Notify the doctor immediately if, of these changes in the patient's condition. If the source of pressure is relieved, if the cast is cut or the dressing loosened by order of the healthcare provider, pain and paresthesia typically decrease and compartment syndrome is avoided. Pulselessness and paralysis are later signs. Because of the possibility of muscle damage, assess urine output. Myoglobin released from damaged muscle cells precipitates and causes obstruction in the renal tubules. This condition results in acute tubular necrosis and acute kidney injury. Common signs are dark reddish brown urine and clinical manifestations associated with acute, acute kidney injury. NCLEX material. Elevation of the extremity may lower venous pressure and slow arterial, arterial perfusion. With suspected compartment syndrome, the extremity should not, once again, should not be elevated above the heart level. Similarly, the application of cold compresses may cause vasoconstriction and exasperate compartment syndrome. Surgical decompression of the involved compartment may be necessary. The fasciotomy site is left open for several days to ensure adequate soft tissue decompression. Infection resulting from delayed wound closure is a potential problem after a fasciotomy. In severe cases of compartment syndrome, an amputation may be required. Another complication is uh, venous thromboembolism. Veins of the lower extremities and pelvis are highly susceptible to thrombus after a fracture, especially hip fractures. VTEs may also occur after total hips or total knees. In patients with limited mobility, venous stasis is aggravated by inactivity of the muscles that normally assist in the pumping action of venous blood from the extremities to the heart. 
because of the high risk of VTE, the orthopedic surgical patient prophylactic anticoagulant drugs such as warfarin or coumadin, low molecular weight heparin um, or Lovenox, or even Xeralto may be ordered. In addition to wearing compression gradient stockings or TED hose and using sequential compression devices or STDs, the patient should dorsoflex and plantar flex the ankle of the affected lower extremity against resistance and perform range of motion exercises on the unaffected leg. Another application is fat embolism or FES. Um, FES is characterized by systemic fat globules from fractures that are distributed into tissues, lungs, and other organs after traumatic skeletal injury. FES is a contribu contributory factor in mortality associated with fractures. The fractures that most often are associated with FES include those of the long bones, ribs, tibia, and pelvis. FES can also occur after to total joint replacement, spinal fusion, liposuction, crush injuries, and bone marrow trans transplantation. Early recognition of FES is crucial to prevent a potentially lethal course. Most patients manifest symptoms within 24 to 48 hours after the injury. Severe forms have occurred within hours of injury. Fat emboli in the lungs cause a hemorrhagic interstitial pneumonitis with signs and symptoms of acute respiratory stress distress syndrome or ARDS, such as chest pain, increased respiratory rate, cyanosis, difficulty breathing, apprehension, um, tachycardia, decreased partial pressure of arterial O2, so your PaO2 will be decreased. These symptoms are caused by poor oxygen exchange. Changes in mental status are also part of a classic triad of signs and symptoms. Investigate memory loss, restlessness, confusion, um, elevated temperature, and headache so central nervous system involvement is not mistaken for alcohol withdrawal or acute head injury. Petechiae located on the neck, anterior chest wall, axilla, buccal membrane, and conjunctivi of the eye, excuse me, of the eye, may help distinguish fat emboli from other problems. They may appear due to intravascular thrombosis caused by a decrease in oxygenation. However, petechiae are only seen in about 25 to 50 percent of cases of FES. The clinical course of a fat embolus may be rapid and acute. Frequently, the patient expresses a feeling of impeding disaster. In a short time, skin color changes from pallor to cyanosis, and the patient may, be, may become comatose. No specific lab examinations are available to aid in the diagnosis. However, certain diagnostic abnormalities may be present. These include fat cells in the blood, urine, or sputum, a decrease of PaO2 to less than 60, ST segment and T wave changes on an ECG or EKG, a decrease in platelet count and hematocrit levels, and an elevated erythrocyte sedimentation rate. So the ESR is going to be elevated. A chest x-ray may show bilateral pulmonary infiltrates. So treatment for fat embolism is directed at prevention. Careful immobiliz immobilization and handling of long bone fracture is probably the most important factor in the prevention of fat embolism. 
reposition the patient as little as possible before fracture immobilization or stabilization because of the danger of dislodging fat droplets into general circulation. Management of FES is most, mostly supportive and related to management of symptoms. Treatment includes fluid resuscitation to prevent hypovolemic shock, correction of acidosis, and replacement of blood loss. We're going to encourage coughing and deep breathing, administer O2 to treat hypoxia, intubation or intermittent positive pressure ventilation may be considered if a satisfactory PaO2 cannot be obtained with supplemental oxygen alone. Some patients may develop a PE, ARDS, or both, leading to increased mortality rate. Most persons survive FES believe it or not. So, a question. A plaster splint is applied with elastic bandage to the leg of a patient with a fractured tibia in preparation for an open reduction and in internal fixation. The patient complains of increasing pain in the affected leg and foot that is not relieved by loosening of the elastic bandage. The most appropriate action by the nurse is to a. Elevate the leg on two pillows. B. Apply ice over the fracture site. C. Notify the healthcare provider. Or D. Perform neurovascular assessment of the foot. And so our answer is going to be D. Prompt accurate diagnosis of compartment syndrome is critical. Prevention or early recognition is key. Regular neurovascular assessments should be performed and documented on all patients with fractures but especially those with injury of the distal humerus or proximal tibia or soft tissue disruption in these areas. Early recognition and treatment of compartment syndrome is essential to avoid permanent damage to muscles and nerves. One, of the, one or more of the following six Ps are characteristic of compartment syndrome. Paresthesia, numbness and tingling, pain or pressure, pallor, pulselessness, and paralysis. Almost forgot paralysis. We know that pulselessness and paralysis are the late signs and all the others are the early. So make sure you're doing your neurovascular checks regularly if you have a patient in this type of situation. And don't forget your six P's. Next question. A patient has a severely sprained ankle from a sports injury what should the nurse teach the patient prior to discharge from the urgent care center? A. Alternate cold and heat for 30 minutes until symptoms are relieved. B. Apply cold for 20, minute, 20 to 30 minutes with breaks of 10 to 15 minutes during the first two days. C. Use continuous cold for the first 24 hours, then continuous heat until the symptoms are relieved. Or D. Apply continuous heat to the ankle for the first 24 hours then continuous cold until the symptoms are relieved. Okay, so the answer is gonna be B. If an injury occurs, immediate care focuses on one, stopping the activity and limiting movement. Second thing we're gonna do is apply ice compresses to the injured area. Next, we will compress the involved extremity and Next, elevate the extremity and finally provide analgesia as necessary. So, um, these interventions will decrease the local inflammation and pain for most musculoskeletal injuries. I will tell you just follow the RICE acronym rest, ice, compress, and elevate. Um, cold or cryotherapy in several forms can be used to produce. Um, produce hypothermia to the involved part. Physio physiologic, physiologic changes that occur in soft tissue as a result of the use of cold include vasoconstriction and reduction in the transmission and perception of ner nerve pain impulses. So we should apply um, cold and then you need to take a break and then you're going to apply cold again. Um,
ICE application should not exceed uh, more than 20 to 30 minutes per application. And after the acute phase, which is usually 24 to 48 hours, warm or mo moist heat may be applied to the affected area to reduce the swelling and provide comfort.